Okay, good morning, and uh, welcome to the three R's of friendship, uh, responsibility, uh, responsiveness or receptivity, and reciprocality or mutuality. Uh, I've, every 10 years or so, it looks like I've done a, this sermon on friendship, and I think I'm actually like only doing this one eight years since my last one. Uh, this week as I was, uh, or past couple weeks as I was preparing, I came across a couple emails which uh, I think will inform some of my comments in the beginning and then I'm going to be picking excerpts out of things I've done in the past. Uh, I did something that I normally don't do. I went back and listened or started to listen to some of the stuff I've done before and I thought th this is just so much better than whatever I'd say now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are four sermons, uh, I think three of them at least have a video uh, that elaborate more than I'm going to do in this series and I'm going to be putting in some new stuff that uh, came about this week which I think would be is going to be really helpful. I'd like to start with uh, the end, <laughs> questions at the bottom which I sometimes do. Uh, how do you know someone's your friend? Uh, and I guess to answer that you would have to you know, think about okay who's my friend and uh, why do I say that they are my friend? One of the things that showed up in my uh, email box this week said that 22% uh, of millennials have zero friends. And almost half of them don't have anybody they could consider a close friend. And less than a third of them say they have a BFF, best friend for life. <laughs> um, so it, it's strange that with, you know, my, my concept of the millennials is they kind of are like a herd. But, uh, you know, so is it like a community thing? But they really say they don't have friends. And that has some disastrous consequences uh, in terms of their mental as well as physical health, which uh, showed up in another email I'll talk to you about uh, this week. So think about your friends. Uh, you know, a friend is someone maybe you like hanging with, you know, someone you, whose company you enjoy. Um, you know, maybe you've got a really close friend and say, they've got my back. Um, so when you think about your circle of acquaintances and hopefully you have some people in there that you'd say they're your friend, think about why they are a friend and after we go through both a biblical and a historical survey of what great thinkers have thought about in terms of friendship, uh, you might want to re-examine uh, just what it is about that person that uh, causes you to define the relationship as a friendship. Uh, then another thing I asked, this is this goes back three or four decades, are, are there, is there any downside to just hanging out with comfortable acquaintances? Uh, and how does biblical fellowship contrast with socializing? So I'm using this series as a follow-up to the series we had on uh, brotherly kindness and affection, uh, which is mandated among believers as they seek to develop a God-glorifying unity. Uh, and commonality seems to be a you know, like like-mindedness, form of commonality, seems to be an important prerequisite for that. But what about just like non-Christian friends? Jesus was called a friend of sinners. Um, he was also called a friend of David and a friend of uh, Abraham. Obviously, those two guys he had a really tight relationship with. But what about, you know, can you have friends? Uh, or what kind of friendships can you actually have with folks who really don't believe the stuff that you believe? Um, how well do you have to know someone to call them a friend? Uh, it's funny, there's this occasion I use this parking garage in the city and uh, there's this Middle Eastern guy who says, how are you, friend? <laughs> I only tip him a buck, so it's, you know, I'm not like, uh, <laughs> it's no biggie. But, uh, you know, so, like, we're going to look at the nature of friendship and uh, how, you, you know, those relationships kind of fit in. Uh, I gave you the whole outline for, we're obviously not going to do all today, just to go through it on your own. Uh, particularly, we'd like you to focus on the skills and activities of friendship and think about how you can develop them to have richer relationships. Uh, before I delve into the uh, neurobiology of relationships and friendships, uh, I thought it'd be appropriate to talk a little bit about the scripture. The word for friend uh, is in both testaments is a uh, word that's also translated love. 
lover. So philos is the Greek word and ahav is the Hebrew word and uh, it's someone that with whom you have a love non-romantic relationship with. And a good spot to take a look at this, uh, so you can always remember it, is the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus' last supper with his disciples. Uh, and he's telling the disciple these, these things, and he's telling us these things, that we might have in us the kind of joy that he has in him and with the Father. And that our joy may be complete or full. So God doesn't give us commands to make our life miserable, but to actually cause us to have joy which most of you know comes from choosing what's best. And then the very next thing he says is, uh, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Uh, and then he tells us a little bit about how he loves us. This is a new commandment because the standard is not as yourself, but is as he has loved us. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Uh, are there any people you would die for? Hmm. I have a really short list of people I would die for. It used to be longer. It's not gotten shorter. But, uh, you know, we call someone a friend. You know, if they're really, you have a really close friend, if uh, each of you would die for each other, and not just potentiality, I, I, I would do that, but actually are taking parts of their life and sacrificing themselves for you and you for them. I had to close the next verse. Most people sing, what a friend we have in Jesus. I think we're going to sing it next week. Uh, but Jesus made it really <laughs> clear what the standard for friendship with him is. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, unfortunately, uh, in our perverted relationships that we have, people say, well, you're my friend if you do what I want. <laughs> uh, if you're God, you can say this. If you're just a human, you cannot say this. Uh, we'll talk about that under reciprocity. Uh, another verse that I think is just worthy of bringing up in the beginning is the concept between a friend and a brother. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So we have blood relations, uh, particularly in the ancient Near East, uh, you had a kinsman responsibility. It was a loyalty to the family that um, you still see parts of some groups in the Middle East, uh, but y y you are honor bound and life bound to help out your uh, blood relation in the midst of difficult times. But a friend is someone that actually you can enjoy and be with and be a companion of at all times. It's not just someone that you use for difficult circumstances. Uh, families pull together even if they don't like each other. Um, but a friend is someone that actually you can have a, I like, I like the concept of companionship in that. But there's some things to be careful about, uh, verses from both testaments. The righteous should choose their friends carefully. You need to be wise about whom you choose. Uh, I was kind of disturbed when I heard a really popular preacher, I listened to about a handful of these guys, say, uh, and actually there are a couple of people historically who said this, uh, who kind of describe friendship as a sifting thing. You just kind of go through you know, life and sifting and sorting the, through the people you meet until you find someone with whom you have commonality and you just kind of fall into a friendship. I think it was C.S. Lewis who might have said, uh, a friend is someone said, who says, you too? I thought I was only one. And you know, even though you know, I have a lot of respect for C.S. Lewis and a lot of stuff he says is great. Uh, and that's also true. I don't think we should be looking for just people we automatically click with uh, because friends are ones that you, friendships develop, they grow. Um, sometimes with people that are very different from you. And Proverbs warns us, uh, the way of the wicked can lead, you as, lead uh, them astray. So your friends can lead you astray. As First Corinthians fifteen thirty three says, "Don't be deceived. You know, Satan will do this. Evil company or companions corrupt good habits or good morals." Uh, we're going to look at a guy who talks about the dragons of bad habits in a minute or two. 
Um, so, you know, as we think about it, friends are someone that looks like we actively choose. We have a choice over whom we'll be a friend with or whom we'll not be a friend of. And by and large, our friendships do result from commonality. Uh, you know, I, I was walking down the, one of the main streets in Zermatt, Switzerland, and uh, it was during a winter break when I was working over there. And I saw two guys that I knew from uh, college uh, also there, and you know, I didn't speak German, they didn't speak German, we both spoke English. And it was like we were best friends all of a sudden because we had the same commonality of being from the same school. And, uh, you know, we spent some time together and uh, it was you know, mutually satisfying. And then when I got back to finish my last semester, um, you know, they were back there and, uh, you know, it, the relationship wasn't the same because the commonality of being the only two English speaking Americans in, from the same college in that town uh, was no longer there. So, you know, it's the commonality, when the commonality changes, the uh, whole idea of uh, the friendship and the perception of the friendship changes. Oh, the perception is an important thing to talk about, too. So, uh, most of these verses are going to be interspersed down below in the next four pages, so we'll come back to them and see them again. Uh, as I was thinking over you know, all the stuff that uh, I researched and particularly stuff I saw this week, I was trying to pull it all together and I really was having trouble. It's, it's like what I do, I need to understand my world and pull it together in a way that makes sense. So I kind of looked at uh, what is it that really makes for uh, a successful friendship. And, and by successful, I mean it's one that endures, it's one that benefits the others, it's one that has the characteristic of a biblical friendship, and one that's going to go on for a, uh, perhaps even a lifetime, although not necessarily, because you know, friends can take different paths. But the three R's of uh, friendship are responsibility, uh, responsiveness, and uh, reciprocation or reciprocality, or one of those words, mutual things. So in the kind of relation, in relationships, each needs to take responsibility for the success of the relationship, be it a marriage, be it a friendship, uh, be it anything. Y you need to be a responsible individual. I don't know if any of you have uh, irresponsible acquaintances. They never show up, they never follow through, they say, let's get together, they never do, you make an appointment, they cancel. Uh -huh. <laughs> Some gal said that she had a friend, uh, this friend who said, oh, we must get together. Okay, how about like next Saturday? And then she calls up, you know, an hour before she's supposed to be there. Oh, can we put it off till next week? Something came up. And she did that six times in a row. <laughs> and the person on the receiving end of this abuse said, okay, th th this is not going to happen. But the responsibility is not just for being like reliable and trustworthy and stuff like that. Um, but it's also you have res take responsibility for the benefit or growth of the other person. So you want the re people have to be committed to a relationship. You know, friends do need to spend some time together, and their thing can't be self-centered. Uh, it, it's got to be about both people and the other person growing as well. And what often happens in relationships is one starts growing, the other one doesn't. They get further and further apart. But responsibility goes so much beyond that, and this explains why I think the millennials have no friends, or 22% of them say they have zero friends, and like almost 50% say they don't have anyone that they would consider uh, an acquaintance that would fall into anywhere near the friendship category, is you need to prepare yourself. Uh, if you think about someone who wants to go out for a team, um, they basically don't just show up and, you know, they, they prepare. I, I remember some woman who was doing a de devotional daily thing talked about seventh grade, she wanted to be on the cheerleading squad. And, uh, you know, she made sure she brought her A-game to the tryouts. And, you know, she polished her sneakers. I didn't know you could even polish sneakers. She had her hair combed. She had been uh, practicing her cheers and yells and splits and everything for, you know, weeks to be able to do that. Um, similarly, uh, I was on a team or two in high school. Uh, you spent the summer beforehand preparing yourself for getting on the team in the fall. 
um, that's true of like the spring training. Uh, it, it's you, you really you need to prepare yourself for being a good friend, uh, both spiritually and socially. And you might want to think if you ever want to be called a friend of God, you've got to prepare for that too. Uh, and if you want to be a friend of others, the best thing you can do is first be a friend of God. That's one of the points I've got down below, and uh, we'll look at that in more depth. But the first command is, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, which doesn't leave a lot over for anything else. And then take all that and love your neighbor as yourself. So friendships are actually fitting under the rubric of you need to love your neighbor as yourself under loving God first and foremost. Uh, when I was in high school, they made us read a book. Uh, it's by a Catholic priest called John Powell, called "Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am?" Um, it's part of a trilogy of "Fully Human, Fully Alive," and "The Secret of Staying in Love." And as a uh, what's the word for it? Celibate, unmarried priest. Or, uh, he had some really great insight into relationships because he spent all this time counseling people on that. And uh, one of the things that either came out of the discussion from the book is part of friendship is you're giving yourself to another person. But if you, you know, consider yourself a lump of dirt, and you take that dirt and you put it in the shoebox and then you give it to the person and say, here, I'm giving you this gift of myself. Uh, duh, thanks, I needed it for my plant. You know, it's like, <laughs> uh, you really can't be a friend unless you are a person of worth or value. Now friends can help us become that way, but you, you need to have something to give and you get that out of the relationship with God. You also need to be a person of character and uh, for the series I did on virtue and character, character comes about from one really simple thing, doing what you don't like to do. Unbelievable, it's that simple. Doing what you don't like to do, which means you need like self-control, you need purpose, uh, you need vision. Uh, you need per perseverance, you need long-suffering, you need those fruits of the Spirit and other stuff to become uh, a person with a noble character or a praiseworthy character. And the Greeks were great on this, uh, that's why you know, it's, I'm so grateful that we have through that history, their, uh, a lot of their collective wisdom which they've collected for the you know, ages before them as well. You need to practice some of those one another passages and then you need to, to 21 verses or so that believers are expressly commanded. So if you're just doing what God tells you, you'll be a better position to be a better friend or spouse. Um, social skills. There are skills that you need to fig, you know, basically deal with your society. Um, you can't be a you know, barbarian or Neanderthal in the midst of refined people. Um, if you're going to be in the 17th century courtly behavior, you needed to understand what that was or you can get your foot in the door. So we're going to look at some of those skills that you need and how you can develop them that can make it so you can kind of go into a place that you don't know anyone and leave with a couple of friends. Um, then there's the whole concept of re responsiveness or receptivity. Uh, in developing potential of the relationship, you need to respond to one another. Uh, in developing commonality, you need to respond to each other. If you have two people who basically don't respond to each other, you don't have a relationship. And you need humility to maybe allow another person to influence you, to be open-minded. Uh, and then you need communication, discussion things. And these are, you know, communication in particular is stuff you can um, work on even in a secular realm. Uh, one famous preacher basically had his whole sermon was just about you need to learn to listen and then learn to talk. <laughs> uh, he spent uh, probably 60% of the time like uh, on learning to listen, and that's we're in a time listening to it, uh, and and yeah, the rest of us are probably on communication. A and then in that relationship, you're actually trying to develop unity or like-mindedness. Uh, I was asking Amanda to tell me about friendship, and uh, she gave me a quote. Oh man, I think it was by Horace. I didn't get to look it up again. He was some old dead Greek guy, and uh, he he's talked about uh, two parts to it. One was a friend is someone whom you have 
uh, the same views on politics and religion. <laughs> uh, it was interesting, even back then, that was the thing that would disunite people. Uh, and, and then there was uh, you know, some other character trait that uh, was necessary for it. But again, a lot of folks think it's just commonality. Uh, it's not, because in order to develop that commonality, you need to humility to listen and learn from each other. Um, and then you have to have something worth sharing with the other person as well. And lastly, and these I'm going to intertwine down, down below, uh, reciprocation. So it's, you know, I think, kind of summed up in the golden rule, whatever you want men to do, to for you, you should do to others. So if they do something nice for you, you should do something nice for them. Um, it's not like you're keeping score, but if you're both looking out for the other's best interest at the expense of yourself, which happens to be what love is about, then you will have this, uh, the relationship will grow. And it will be just. Uh, the problem arises with unjust relationships. Uh, some people think relationships should just be 50-50. And, uh, and they keep track of everything. So if I've done my 50% you know, percent, so now it's up to you. Um, some people think it should be, you know, 99-1. Um, well, if you have a relationship that's 99-1, you know, it, it, it's not a relationship. It's, you know, one person's using the other. Uh, and that is unjust, because uh, God judges us for the benefits received. You know, the world calls it karma. Um, but it's, you know, you reap what you sow. And if you're sowing selfishness, you reap that yourself sowing other centeredness you'll reap that as well so relationships are supposed to be mutually beneficial uh, there was one guy an old Asian guy who said uh, he's down, quoted down below uh, always cultivate a relationship with people that are better than yourself which sounds good when you first think about that but wait a minute that's just using other people it, you know, th th why should they cultivate a relationship with you? <laughs> because if they follow that advice, you know, they wouldn't be talking to you because you're not better than they are. So um, the whole idea of reciprocation being mutually beneficial and edifying uh, needs a po point so that each grows in Christ's likeness. And if you think about a relationship with Christ, he did and has done and continues to do and will do far, 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 far more for us than we could ever do vis-a-vis -vis him. Um, but he does expect things from us. You're my friends if you do what I command. So there's, you know, th there's even a reciprocation in the relationship uh, with us and God, which is perfectly summed up in the whole idea of hesed or covenantal loyalty. And, and it specifies each party has responsibilities that in order for the covenant to continue, they need to fulfill. So reciprocation is kind of really important. Uh, you know, there's takers and givers. And if you are taking more than you give, you're not only being a selfish pig, you are being unjust and you're setting yourself up for judgment. So the three R's, you might want to just think through some of your relationships as a minor point of application. I lost my phone. Does this give me time down here? No. Um, it's my, oh, here, it's in my pocket. <laughs> ah, got it. Sorry about that. All right. You might want to just evaluate, like, who's responsible for the success of your relationship, uh, and how are you preparing for your relationships? How are you at responding to the other person and listening to and understanding them? Uh, one of Stephen Covey's principles was seek first to be understood, I mean, understand, and then to under, be understood. Uh, and then, you know, is, is your reciprocal relationship? A one-sided relationship is not healthy. So speaking of healthy stuff, let's go take a look at some of the emails I got this week. Uh, this showed up in a number of spots. I pulled these quotes out of Psychology Today because it pulled the same studies that I was reading separately. Uh, Some place called YouGov uh, said 30% of millennials, uh, those are people who are now like 23 and 38, always or often feel lonely. Wow. But I thought they were always hanging together. Yeah, you can feel lonely in a crowd. 
22% of them said, the number of friends I have are zero. 27% said, I have no close friends. Add those two together, that's 49%. Just about half of these people have no friends or no close friends. Their no close friends are really acquaintances, people that they may be like doing something with. But it's just sad, and we'll look at some of the reasons why. Um, some guy, uh, Cassiopo, I don't know, spent over 20 years researching loneliness. And this is key. This was reflected a couple times in her praises. Uh, it's perceived social isolation. Uh, as you look at your social relationships, you perceive them as uh, not being good and that you are isolated from real relationships. Uh, someone was looking at the series on perception and performance, and perception really does dictate our reality. So we need to learn how to perceive things correctly. He goes on to say it's, it's a discrepancy between what you want from your social relationships and your perception of those re so social relationships. Now some people want the wrong things from their social relationships. I want to be unconditionally loved and unconditionally accepted and always do what pleases me. Okay, not going to happen. Um, in the old days, back in the days before electricity, <laughs> go back to there, um, when you had to watch TV by candlelight, um, <laughs> you, you had, the society actually kind of dictated or mandated your relationships, and you kind of fell into them, and you didn't get people being depressed, uh, because you had perceptions that were you know, in tune with the reality of your environment. But now, wow, okay, uh, the internet has, social media, I guess we'll call it that, has greatly exacerbated so many mental health problems because it gives us the perception that everybody's having fun and we're not. And one of the things I read, a gal said she was feeling down. She, you know, flipped on, you know, went to her social media, flipped through it, and saw one of her friends uh, there uh, with a group of people at a restaurant, everybody's smiling and laughing and having a wonderful time, and then uh, her, you know, depression deepened or despondency increased uh, because, like, well, why didn't she invite me? Like, uh, I bet she was my friend, and here she is having a great time, and I'm having this miserable life, and, you know, I can't binge watch anymore. My eyes are falling out. <laughs> um, but then the friend the next day said, oh, I went to this thing last night, it was a group of someone else's friends. Uh, I really didn't relate to any of the people there. I wish you were there. Hmm. So when we see things, we don't always perceive them accurately. Her friend actually wanted her there, was not having a good time, but you look at the thing, you know, nobody puts up a selfie of them having, a, well, I guess right. nowadays they do. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. But, you know, that, that really has, I think, hampered this relationship as long as the fact that the, well, the thing that they do not have, the self-discipline, uh, the character to be a good friend. And that's why they're just kind of you know, swimming in this mess of lemmings in the swamp. Um, so how you perceive things should be, and if you have a biblical perspective of how things should be and it's not there, then you actually have cause for rejoicing because you, know, you look, read Proverbs, and Proverbs is what's generally true. And if you have fulfilled the requirements for what's generally true coming to pass, and it doesn't come to pass, then like Job, at the end, you have cause for rejoicing. Because he'd done all the right things. Look what happened to him. So God normally has something planned for folks like Paul, who had what we would say would be terrible lives on the outside. Uh, people feel distress between the number of friends they want versus how many they actually have. Uh, this denotes a huge um, immaturity. We want, and when we don't have what we want, we pout and fuss and complain and get depressed because we're immature. This is life, people. You can't always get what you want. 
I remember one summer I was up uh, in a grocery store line. Uh, we'd gone up there to uh, pick up some stuff at the grocery store. And there was this uh, father and a uh, little girl in front of us. And of course, at the checkout line, they have all the you know, candy and all the stuff that the kids really like, so they'll grab it. And nowadays, they, the kids will make a fuss and get it. But she said she wanted it, and her dad said, What's rule number one? She powdered a little bit and said, You can't always have what you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's life. Yeah. You can't always have what you want. Um, so, you know, it's an immature mindset that thinks, I should always have what I want. But you know, our narcissistic culture uh, enhances that desire, and then we, even when we have what far exceeds what people have had before us, we, you know, don't like it. Count your blessings, name them one by one. In fact, that's going to be one of the things that the uh, next guy is going to talk about. So we have a tendency to compare ourselves with others. The scriptures have anything to say about that? The one who compares himself with others is not wise, foolish, stupid. Don't do that. Uh, and it's a process heavily exacerbated, made worse by the rise of social media. Boom, 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 boom. So, I just kind of told you one of the examples of social media. Everybody's having a good time. You're not. You're left out. That's not the reality. Um, and don't let your desires and wants be formed by social media, a.k.a. Satan's system, because it's all about whirlings. Uh, the guy who was writing this article for psychological research, I mean, psychology today is part of a, a group that for 30 years have been studying uh, basically white people are dysfunctional, unhappy, and depressed. And the most common thing is this critical inner voice. Freud would have called it your superego. Uh, other people would call it your self-talk. But it's a, most people experience this, and this common critical inner voice tells you you are different from other people in some basic negative way. They're all tall and you're short. They're all happy and you're not. They all have X and you don't have X. They don't have Y and you got Y. Yeah, so it's this comparison um, is, and then the fact that we criticize ourselves for not having it and get down ourselves just makes life worse. So, don't do that. All right. Um, this stuff, okay, comes out of uh, Amen Clinics. Uh, the, what's his name? David. Daniel. Daniel, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I don't know how he wound up subscribing to his newsletters, but uh, every now and then, on a weekly basis, I'll delve into them. I, I really like him because uh, he's not just a theorist. Uh, he does brain scans on people and finds out what actually is going on inside them and recommends both nutritional supplements as well as uh, certain therapy. And I'm going to take a look at one of the things he's currently doing that I think you might find helpful. Um, he cites a Harris poll that others have that 44% of these lonely millennials have been diagnosed with at least one chronic lifetime health condition. Okay, so we got almost the majority of them are lonely. Uh, we know that with older people, as they hit like 75 or so, their health goes down more significantly, and that coincides with not having friends, being isolated, uh, going into retirement, away from the, the common out, the common friendship things. I, I wanted to find a chart, maybe I'll find it for next week, that shows that uh, the, the most well-adjusted um, population group are the, uh, the great generation, actually the pre-baby boomers, followed by the baby boomers, followed by Generation X. And it's gotten progressively worse. and. Uh, one millennial put it this way. She said, um, you know, I got, I had a child, I got married, and I bought a house. And uh, 
none, no one I know has any three of those things. And my basically commonality is all gone. She can't relate to anyone. And one of the dangers of millennials and just having you know, kids in general just cling to their peer group for safety and protection uh, is that when th conditions change, they can't handle it. Um, and then the reason that the older generations are better is they tend to stay in the same environment. I was shocked to see that most people's friends go back, the ones that they uh, uh, are considered best friends with or you know, closest to a good friend, go back to high school. And uh, you know, I don't think I've kept in touch with anyone from high school. I've kept in touch with guys in college for the past 40 years. But uh, And the reason when you were in high school, everything was kind of the same. And then as your life changes, you lose that kind of commonality. And relationships that are just built on commonality don't endure because things change. So uh, as you feel more lonely, you're, you, you don't get this master hormone called oxytocin, which is used for bonding, but it also controls your other hormones and it makes you feel good about yourself. So that could be why some of these chronic health conditions are existing. But what is really alarming to Dr. Amen is that uh, the four out of the top five chronic conditions and six out of the top 10 fall into mental or behavioral health categories. So Blue Cross Blue Shield did a study, and uh, he quotes that the number one chronic health condition is depression, followed by substance abuse, alcohol disorder. All three are mental. Uh, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, which actually has some uh, behavioral and mental components. Hyperactivity. I was really surprised to see that uh, categorized as that. And then psychotic disorder. A psychotic disorder. Neuroses is just like moral people. We, we're kind of crazy. Psychosis is you break with reality. So to see that that high up there, the, all the underlying ones are the mental or behavioral ones. Uh, then you have Crohn's, ulcerative uh, colitis, which also is due to stress. High cholesterol tobacco use disorder, I didn't know it was a disorder, but I guess it is, and type 2 diabetes. So 44% of millennials have been diagnosed with at least one of these things. Some of them had like five of them. And the rates for these conditions are rising dramatically, not even counting the increases experienced due to the pandemic. 92% of the COVID folks, or in, who lived during COVID times, have said that it has a negative impact on their mental health. Among the millennials, the pandemic contributed to major increases in unhealthy behaviors. So they went back to uh, 1917 and 18 and got a baseline. And then they got a new ba uh, data about how some of these behaviors have increased. And this is just among millennials. And I think a lot of these went up in all categories. But there was a 34% rise in alcohol consumption, 25% rise in smoking, 17% in vaping, and 16% in non-medical drug use. Um, other studies I came across showed how people just gave up their exercise programs. They, they you know, they gave up uh, oh all the healthy habits they developed, uh, and they just sat on the couch and binge watched things. So uh, yeah, it's. There's reasons why the health is actually declining. Okay, now, this is going to sound complex. Uh, it is, but it's actually got some simple things. There's a constant dance between different parts of your brain, and they fight against each other. And you're, you're, this stuff's going on in your head, uh, from Dr. Amen, because uh, they can see what happens. And uh, I stumbled across this decades ago when I put together Toil, uh, and I framed it as the judge and the robot. The prefront, prefrontal cortex, that's the stuff up in front of your forehead, which causes you to bang your head against the wall, <laughs> is involved in focus, judgment, and impulse control. Okay, that's your rational thinking. The majority of what's in your brain is the amygdala and the basal ganglia. Uh, the amygdala, so that's down further back. 
is the part of your emotional brain that responds to threats. Yeah. Reduce the threat. <laughs> you know, it causes anxiety, stress, fear. Um, that's I remember the perception and performance stuff tells you that you can make it so that it gets filtered so it doesn't come in as the saber-toothed tiger is about to chew you up. Uh, and then your basal ganglia where habits are shaped and stored. This is why you never want to teach yourself to like things that are bad for you because uh, it gets stored there automatically and uh, the line that I left off is that um, it's just as expressing a bad habit or a good habit uh, require the same amount of energy yeah. um, and you tend I think but it's much much easier to form bad habits because the stimulus that you have in your life uh, responded to incorrectly uh, it's much easier to you know, get the bad habits formed and then I share with you in sermons past on how they train monkeys to do a task and then sacrifice them and study their brains which means they kill them um, and they discovered that the monkeys who have been trained to do different tasks had ruts in their brain that were like the path of least resistance. And then you have these automatic knee-jerk reactions that you don't think about anymore. And your robot has taken over. And it's, your robot is not serving you. You are serving your robot. And that is not a good place to be. Holy Spirit, not involved. Um, but he needs to be involved for you to change. Okay, so when the prefrontal cortex... That's the, BFC there, you know, BFC, okay, is healthy and strong, it can help direct or supervise the addition of healthy habits. But that conscious level of thinking only comprises 10% of your thinking, in terms of the Judge Robot studies. When the BFC is weak, it's more easily influenced by what he calls untamed dragons. Now, the guy's a believer. I think he's first probably thinking of demons, but realized he would not get the receptivity that he did if he called them that, so he calls them dragons. The impulses take over, causing many bad habits to form. Oh, here it is. If I could cover this one. Good or bad habits take the same amount of energy. So when you start thinking about you know, why are millennials unhealthy, a uh, part of it is because they've never trained themselves to have correct responses to things and they don't have friends that can actually help them because it seems like the mantra of, of millennials is unconditional acceptance and then you get your worth and value from being part of this group that uh, accepts you. Um, when I do my Western Civ courses I talk about uh, Jose uh, Ortega, Spanish nobleman who did some real good thinking and said what they're seeing, and this is back in the time around World War II, is the rise of mass man. It's not thinking, it's not rational, it believes in the right of might, uh, it's, satis it's satisfied with thinking whatever, there's the first thing that pops into their mind and then they fight for that. And it's just, they're crazy people. Um, so I'm not, I don't have enough of a grip on the millennial uh, mindset to see if that's true in a broader sense currently. But it is definitely a historical tendency for people to adopt groupthink in the wrong manner. Okay, so what I want to do is expose you to some things in Amen. Um, this is called Know Your Dragons. It comes from him. Uh, if you're struggling with stress, fear, depression, and self-defeating thoughts, it's not your fault. Okay, so he's a re he's really popular psychiatrist. Uh, he you know, is the psychiatrist to the stars, but also normal people, but he's really, really expensive. Uh, a, a lot of his peers don't like him because they don't know how to do brain scans, so they're going to knock his work because it differs from them. You know, so it's a threat. He's a threat. But uh, I think he is pretty helpful. I think he's done 100,000 brain scans plus. And he's got a little dragon quiz. So take our free quiz to discover what dragons are making you sad, mad, nervous, or out of control, and learn how to tame them and feel better. He's got a book he wants to sell, which I might be tempted to go through. Uh, I don't know if I will or not. Uh, I didn't go through the quiz. I kind of looked at the first questions and realized where it was going. It's, it's, it's one of these quizzes you can easily uh, fake out. But I like his dragons. B these are critters that he came up with. Oh, I don't have it here. I've got it on another screen. 
these are critters that uh, he's developed in should be down below okay oh it is um, discover your dragons from the past there's the guy uh, he's got three minutes to blurb I haven't listened to that your past can play havoc with your relationships your health and causing you tons of unnecessary stress hi I'm Daniel Amon all right so you get blah 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 um, you can read through this just meet your dragons from the past so he identified 13 dragons including their origins triggers that make them overpowering and how they cause you to react so uh, this actually matches some of uh, Gothard's uh, Institute of Basic Youth Conflict. So you know, people have arrived at it's the same when they study the same thing and they're looking for truth. They arrive at the same position, but you feel inferior or flawed. So uh, he's going to have a section on dealing with that. They feel anxious, and this dragon controls them. It basically breathes fire into their brain and burns them up. Uh, then there are wounded dragons. There are lots of damaged people. Then this, this is particularly true of the millennials, the special spoiled or entitled dragons, the ones whose parents never said no and gave into every tantrum that the kid threw. Then we have the responsible dragons. These are ones that probably get, you know, just looking at the picture, they want to heal people and be responsible, and probably develop into codependent relationships. Then you got the angry dragons who are frustrated with life, they don't like the way things go. Then we got the judgmental dragons. You know, they were judged or they judge others to make himself feel superior. The death dragons, I don't quite know where that one's going. Um, then there's the hopeless or helpless dragons. Oh, I can't do anything. Oh, it's me. Uh, ancestral dragons. So uh, when I was growing up, I had a tennis partner who lived across the street from me who was an Indian psychiatrist. and We played tennis together. And he was a Christian. And he said that uh, what he believes causes uh, the vast, he worked at Sloan Kettering, majority of the uh, problems we see today are due to family demons. So uh, it, I used to think, okay, it's just bad habits that got passed down, but the uh, more I understand how the demons work, uh, I, I would agree that they're demons that inhabit and develop traits in families. Uh, then there's the abandoned, invisible, or insignificant dragon. See that little guy right there. Uh, they never got affirmed or celebrated. Well, then I, you know, big dragons are excluding them. It's called junior high. Um, <laughs> then there's the grief or lost dragons. Uh, this picture is from uh, counseling people who have lost a loved one, and they never got to say the things that they want. Uh, I can't remember what kind of therapy it's called, but you talk to an empty chair. Uh, so you pay to go to a psychiatrist, and then they tell you to talk to the empty chair and tell the person what you would want to tell them and then people feel better. Um, it supposedly works. Then we got the should and shaming dragons. So uh, ones who are criticized and go and criticize others as they grow up. So I'm assuming his book does all this. Once you identify, you shut down self store capacity, reduce your vulnerability to schemers and heal addictions. Uh, it's essential for your mental health because when they take control of your brain, your entire life suffers. So for every dragon, he's going to give tips and strategies on how to tame them. So I uh, just looked at one of the things he said to get a feel for where he was going with it. And he mentioned some kind of therapy, and I looked that up. And it's as simple as um, you, know, you stabilize the, the brain. He used uh, things like uh, complex uh, saffron, um, oh, curcumin, is one of oh, fish oil. Uh, some things to kind of feed your brain because your brain needs to have you know, the raw materials to work with to repair itself. And then the, the therapy uh, started with take two minutes every morning in the shower to say something you're thankful for. Well, that's a good biblical principle. Like in everything, give thanks. Uh, and then to get, if you really want to be serious about it, you keep a journal and every night you think through what you have to be thankful for. So I am really thankful for, when I'm taking a shower, hot water. <laughs> you know, this is really nice for those of us that have a hyper nervous system. It feels pain immensely. Um, so, yeah, it's, so I'll, I'm going to look and see what I can find uh, and share some of that next week. But 
you want to figure out what dragons uh, you need to slay first or tame, uh, that would be a good spot to start. Okay, before I start looking at friend or foe, any uh, questions or thoughts? Okay, there are none. Um, so, I did this back in 93, 03, 13. Actually, I should be doing it in one, two more years. Like, yeah. <laughs> but I, these are sermons. Uh, I'm not gonna, I go through all of them. I'm not going to do that with you now. But uh, just some of the concepts. A friend is one joined to another. It's a relationship there. It's a bond. Intimacy and mutual benevolence. In order for it to be a real friendship, you got to have the engage in mutual beneficence. You bless each other. You do things that are in each other's best interest. It's independent of sexual or family love. I don't like Aristotle's things too much, but uh, I like another one he says, but not this one. Uh, I like this one down here. Liking seems to be an emotion, but friendship is a disposition. Now, we don't use disposition that much. You know, we're disposed to do something. It's a tendency to do something. It's actually when you dispose of something, you make a choice, and that's his meaning of it. Uh, it's a fixed state of mind. Uh, liking may just as much be felt for inanimate objects. And I think the illustration I used before is like, I like chocolate. But does chocolate like me? I don't know. <laughs> um, I like chocolate and I eat it and then it's gone. This relationship is so transient. <laughs> but mutual affection, okay, that's what we're looking for. Mutuality is a matter of deliberate choice. And that deliberate choice, it's an act of the will, springs from a fixed disposition, which is a matter of character and purpose. Uh, who's this guy down here? Euripides. The rule of friendship means it should be mutual sympathy between them, each supplying what the other lacks, trying to benefit the other using friendly and sincere words. Oh, that's Buddha, my bad. Um, <laughs> okay, the Euripides said there's life has no blessing like a prudent friend. Uh, so someone who is wise, it's really a blessing. Uh, Thoreau, who spent a lot of time in isolation, said a man cannot be said to succeed in this life who does not satisfy one friend. Uh, so I quote people that are not necessarily talked about on Sunday mornings. Uh, like Buddha, because it shows that this, this is a universal thing, that people are uh, designed for having this relationship. Millennials were described as being no good at relationships, since their primary uh, friendships are with their plants and their pets. <laughs> so there's been this huge explosion in millennials gardening. You know, they're filling down went to the store, got some flowers to cheer herself up, but she saw this little succulent, a jade stone succulent. It's a plant that doesn't require much care. And she took it home <laughs> and uh, didn't kill it. And then she wound up with like 120 some odd plants. And then, uh, and then, then there's this whole social network of people into their plants. I think she has 22,000 followers because she describes each new plant she gets and how she manages not to kill it. Um, and it points to the fact that God has made us uh, with a desire to take care of others. That's why there's such a de you know, desire for pets as well. You know, the pet market has bloomed. Um, the doggy daycare places have not done as well because people are now home taking care of their pets themselves. But um, So we're, we're made to have care for each other. It's wired into our DNA. And uh, if we live in isolation, it doesn't happen. If we don't develop the skill set to become a friend, it's not going to happen. Let's see what else we got here. I love quotes. Um, Save me reading tons of <laughs> stuff I'd rather not have to read. Um, in terms of relationships, a while back I, I did something on this and incorporated it into the friendship series. Uh, lots of people have unhealthy counterfeit relationships. 
And I would submit that if you looked at most relationships that your acquaintances have, they would be a masquerade ball. And you might re be only relating to them in a masquerade ball. As opposed to a biblical fellowship is a mountain climb. So a masquerade ball needs externals. You need costumes, music, food, dancing to keep it going. And it always stays on the same level, in the same place, regardless of the apparent activity. They're dancing, but they're back in the same place. Focus and admiration is on the externals. Oh, I just love that sequin mask. Where'd you get that? Um, people remain mysteries. And the whole relationship is ruined when someone takes off their mask and becomes real. Relationships are superficial, ultimately boring. Oh, no, not boring. And these are succumbers rather than overcomers. Contrast that to what I understand, and I think the scriptures would validate, biblical fellowship is a mountain climb. It requires self-denial. It requires skill. It's progressive. It's goal-reaching. It doesn't stay in the base camp commenting about, wow, look at that nice mountain up there. Let's go climb it. And then you have to have high commitment to each other's safety. Um, so you, you rope together, um, and if you fall off the mountain, you could be pulling others off the mountain, so you need to be really certain that you don't do that. Yet survival is not the only goal, otherwise you might as well stay in the base camp. People are roped together but independent. Each one bears his own burdens. So Galatians 6 talks about this, where each one bears his own burdens, yet you're supposed to bear one another's burdens. And uh, apparent uh, in contradiction is done by just knowing that the word for burden that you're supposed to bear is a knapsack size burden. You can do it. The burden that you have to uh, share with others is a cannon-sized burden. You can't carry a cannon up the mountain. Uh, a mountain climb, particularly appropriate for our current day and age, is hampered by unreality or masks, as is breathing. Uh, you value and appreciate the internals. You, know, you can admire their gear in the base camp, but basically it's the internal stuff that really keeps you on the mountain together. Uh, it's challenging and richly rewarding. It requires effort, it requires teamwork. I was almost going to follow up this series with the sluggard, because relationships require work. Brotherly love requires work. You cannot be lazy and be a godly person. It's not possible. And at times, a mountain climb can be terrifying. Uh, when I was in Zermatt, Switzerland, the story I told you about earlier, uh, I've shared this a couple of times, but. Uh, I fell in with a group of ski instructors and uh, mountain guides. And near the end of my stay there, they said, hey Bill, uh, we're going to go hike up uh, under the north face of the Matterhorn and ski down on the other side. Uh, the snow bowls are full of snow, like waist high powder, uh, like unbelievable conditions. And they said, count me in. So, uh, you know, six o'clock, as soon as the lifts opened, we took them up to as far as we could. And then we started climbing. And uh, you had your skis in one hand, and my skis were kind of heavy, and poles, and you're wearing your hiking, you're not your hiking boots, your ski boots, and mine were pretty heavy as well. So I'm there, and they said, okay, you know, whatever you do, don't lean into the mountain, just stand upright. Because when you lean into the mountain, then your feet slide back, and you go down into the crevasse, and literally it was thousands of feet below. It was like super scary. And I'm thinking, God, help me, how did I get into this? And as long as I kept upright, um, I was okay. Once I kind of went forward and I started slipping about eight inches back and I managed to dig my skis and poles in and get back upright. Uh, the, the sad part about it is when I finally got up to the top, I had expended all my energy getting there. <laughs> so uh, some of the guys just tug off and, you know, they're it's like the thing you see in the ski movies. There's powder spraying or going through. and. In order to do that, you have to bend your knees and unbend them and unweight. And I, I just couldn't do that. So I would just go as far as I could until I was picked up too much speed and fall in the snow. And hopefully I wasn't falling on a rock as I tried to follow where those guys had been. Otherwise, I would have impaled myself and not be here. Um, and then eventually, when uh, the couple guys that were looking out for me, realizing I was kind of hopeless, um, you know, said, OK, we're going to take off. You should have prob no problem. And 
I think it was a, it took me six hours of skiing going down the mountain because it wove through trees. It was beautiful. It was the most fantastic ski run I ever had. And I basically quit skiing after that because yeah. nothing I could ever do would equal that. And I think I went skiing once or twice when I got back east. And oh, it's just like you're skiing on these little bumps of ice. It was just miserable. However, the mountain climb was terrifying. <laughs> The rewards on the other side were great, but I didn't have the skills and discipline, you know, it's high elevation, I wasn't used to it, uh, to really appreciate it and benefit from it. Biblical fellowship is something that God gives you strength to do. Uh, you can make it happen, and it's worth the rewards. If you're lazy, you'll never reach the heights. You won't enjoy it. So next week, I'll start on the toil relationships objective. I'd like you to think about this particularly this week. Why do you have your relationships? Uh, most people have their relationships to have their needs met by others rather than God. To get my needs for stimulation, fun, security, fulfillment, companionship, worth and value met through others. Um, some People say, I, I, I never want to be hurt or vulnerable in a relationship. Well, you're never going to have a relationship then. Others say, I want to be accepted and supported unconditionally. Okay, you could not even have that relationship with God. So why would you try to think you can get it from a finite, flawed human being? Or this is sad ones. These are people who do anything for you. To please others so they'll like me. I really feel for these people. Of course, they'll do a lot of good stuff for you, but <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to use other people for your needs. So what's the better one? Um, well, this is from a biblical perspective. Intimate, transparent, accountable relationships with stimulate Christ-likeness. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. So look at the questions on the bottom. Give some thought to who your friends are, who you consider a friend, why you consider them a friend. If you really want to go the extra mile, you can be thinking about um, what do you get and give out of each relationship? And where is that relationship headed? Why do you hang with the people you hang with? So you'll feel good about yourself? Or to please Christ? What, 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 you know, where are you really going with these relationships? Why do you put some time into it? Um, and if you work on developing the skills that we're going to talk about to, for these relationships, You'll probably get better mental health, better physical health, and you'll probably, you know, the King James says in one of my verses, um, he who has friends must show himself to be friendly. Uh, that's the King James Version. Unfortunately, it's a, uh, probably a, uh, what do you call it, a typo, for lack of a better word. It's a word that can be read a couple different ways, and most of the modern translations give a trend, be caught, be, talk about being cautious in friendship or something like that. Okay, any last questions? All right, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you that you are infinitely wise in the way that you divine, des uh, designed us, uh, reflecting you, because we're made in your image. You are a uh, being that has uh, relationships at your very core, in the Trinity. So you designed us to have relationships. You hardwired us. You created us with brains and uh, to, to engage in relationships. And you have a plan for how those relationships should work, designed by the creator and manufacturer. Uh, I pray that you would guide us in having the kind of relationships that would uh, glorify you, that would benefit others as well as ourselves. Uh, that would be used by you to uh, influence others as they behold how we love one another. Uh, I pray that you would show us uh, what dragons we've allowed into our lives that are uh, destroying us from the inside out. And uh, you'd give us the grace and power to uh, learn about them, and tame them, or defeat them. I uh, thank you that your desire is for us to be like Christ in every way, and I pray that you would conform us to his image uh, in the temporal realm as well as the eternal. We ask this in his name for his glory. Amen. I think you need to turn on the volume. I think it's muted. Oh, so unmuted. I'm, 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 I'm,
I'm sorry, I had the volume muted. Was there a question that I missed? I'm sorry. Sorry, no, I was just going to go into clarify. You mentioned some questions to think about, and I, I think you're referring to the ones on at the end of the, the sermon um, attachment that you provided, correct, on page six, or were there other questions no. that you wanted us to consider during the week? Uh, the end of the one on page six, and then the ones I just kind of mentioned about what you get out of each relationship. Um, oops, battery running low. Uh, Oh, I just yeah. Uh, maybe someone took some notes and <laughs> you can send them around. Like review each relationship. Where is it headed? You review. Oh, that's right. Here, here, here. It's Oops, on this side. side. Okay. As a true introvert, I have trouble doing two things at once. Uh, so, where's the relationship headed? Uh, what What do you contribute to it? What do you get out of it? Um, why do you have the relationship? So, you, if you read ahead, you'll look at some of the skills that are required, and you know what are the characteristics of good relationships. So if, if, if you go th through the outline ahead of it, you'll get much more out of next week because I'm going to just skim through stuff. Um, so like I give you a bunch of, like in these, this box that's on your screen, I give you a bunch of things that I wasn't planning on uh, uh, elaborating upon because I've done that in other sermons. And if you really like torture, you can listen to my previous sermon on this where I <laughs> elaborate on these things and I will... You'll probably dip into the, those thoughts again uh, where appropriate next week. Thank you for clarifying. Can I have one more question? Sure. Um, just on the Aristotle quote, I'm curious if maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between an emotion of disliking or liking and the disposition you have toward the person. Um, sure. Like when, I, when I look at the word dislike, it's actually it's pretty strong. It's like distaste or hostility towards, so maybe that's too strong of a word for dislike, and that's what's confusing me in it. Okay, so liking is something that arises out of something that is pleasing to you. And disliking arises out of something that is displeasing to you. Like you like a certain type of food, and you dislike other types of food. Uh, when you were younger, you probably did not like blue cheese and mushrooms. Those are you know, two of the things, or scotch. Uh, as people get older, some of them develop a real taste and sometimes a passion for those things. We um, are really good at deceiving ourselves uh, and live in an Egyptian river called denial um, when it comes to, well, you're not supposed to dislike people. So you, uh, you know, won't really acknowledge that you dislike them, but you know, a test of like liking someone or disliking someone is if you go into a room where there's a group of people, um, you who do you gravitate towards? And who do you kind of shy away from and breathe a sigh of relief when they kind of turn from you? Uh, when I was uh, used to go to a, a some events for a nonprofit, and uh, I would make a number of friends there, and I also come across some people that had the diametrically opposed uh, worldviews to me. Um, one was a rabbi who basically just did not believe in the scriptures, did not believe in absolute truth. <laughs> uh, we actually have wound up becoming friends. Uh, it's unbelievable, but I would want to avoid him when I first saw him because I dislike the guy because he stands against truth on so many levels. Uh, but I actually made the decision to develop a relationship with him, even though in terms of uh, persuasion it's a lost cause, and when we would eventually go to events and see each other later, we would gravitate towards each other, and I uh, would relate to him on the grounds that uh, mutuality that we had established. So liking is, can change, and when you, you know, when your emotion, this happens with, you know, friends, lovers, ma marriage relationships, you you know, parents and kids, when you have a little two-year-old, you know, put their nose up and say, I hate you. And if you say, why? You won't let me have another ice cream. <laughs> you know, it's like, I like you. Why? Oh, because you give me all the ice cream I want. So, uh, that's the difference between like and disposition is, is a fixed frame of mind. Uh, so that's what mutual affection is. Liking is an emotion. 
dislike is also an emotion and that is so transient when you look at what is it that why do you like or dislike someone um, I like the way they make me feel okay what do you do when they don't make you feel the way you like and one of the things you're going to see is for a friendship iron sharpens iron uh, so someone who really loves you is going to tell you things that you don't want to hear and if you base your relationships on like, you're just a toddler. You're, you're not fit for adult relationships, uh, and you know you don't grow. Uh, but scriptures say, you know, let a righteous man strike me; it will be a kindness. Then you know you're going to see later. Uh, it's a sign of a good friendship that uh, you know a friend will tell you something that you don't want to hear, and it's the greatest sign, except for receiving it graciously. So if you flip ahead on the quotes you'll come across that one okay I've kept you too long but I thought really quick just so in your example did you with this person was it a matter of putting away the emotion of dislike so that you would actually develop the relationship if emotion drives you to action would the emotion not impact your disposition towards the person okay so you go back to the amygdala it rules over your emotions so an objective rules over my emotions and that's part of self-control that I do not let my emotions take me away from the objective I did I move my yeah I started looking for some positive things in the relationship I thought to build commonality in the relationship so that the person wasn't as odious as odious to me as initially when I found out that they were a real enemy of the truth uh, the, the guy's got demons but you know a lot of people I deal with have demons so uh, you know I managed to put that aside, uh, Jesus dealt with people who were demon-possessed. So we should be able to do it without the demons jumping on us as well. So, yeah, I, I, you can change your emotions. Remember, an emotion, it goes through two filters. Filter number one is how you perceive things. Filter number two is how you express it. And uh, I, I can take, you know, take in some of the, the, the person is not evil, um, intentionally interpersonal evil. Uh, on a broader level, they've got this you know, big broadcast that affects a number of people, you know, incorrectly. But um, if you know, I, I want to try to influence him so he can positively influence others in the right direction. Uh, so yeah, the emotion can change, and that's why you don't want to base it on just liking. Uh, I'm sure Jesus did not like having to repeat the same stuff again and again to the disciples. I'm sure he did not like the Pharisees. Yeah, he looked at them in anger because they are you know, doing so much damage. But he dialogued with them, you know, for a number of reasons. Part of God's purpose, setting them up for judgment, giving us you know patterns of how to relate, and uh, with the hopes that uh, they would, uh, and some of them did, uh, repent. So let's talk more about this next week, and. Uh, I already prayed, so my time is up.